Hello, my name is Anke Timmermann. I'm a historian of science, a fellow of the Linnaean Society, and also an antiquarian bookseller. Today, I would like to introduce you to a number of objects that I've had the privilege of working with for the past few weeks. They are the engravings made for Joseph Banks's Florilegium. In this video, I would like to talk about the methods that Joseph Banks and his associates employed to gather, preserve, draw and describe the plants while they were still voyaging on board the Endeavour. The following video will then introduce the making of the engravings in much more detail. In 1768, Joseph Banks joined the crew of the Endeavour as its naturalist. He was only 25 years old and he was very enthusiastic about going abroad. We set sail from Plymouth, after having been confined there by contrary winds for almost 10 days, all in high spirits, myself more particularly, as I was after many delays, at last fairly embarked in an undertaking from which I promised myself three years uninterrupted enjoyment of my favourite pursuit. In 1771, Joseph Banks returned to London and he brought with him a large amount of specimens, some drawings that had been made from them, some draft descriptions, and perhaps most importantly, he had hatched the plan to make an illustrated catalogue that would show the plants that he had seen across the world in all their beautiful detail. But it took more than 200 years and the collaboration of generations of craftsmen to realise Banks's plans and to produce the engravings that we have today. After the endeavour set off from Plymouth, a short stop was made at Madeira for supplies, but Joseph Banks then really looked forward to reaching Brazil, the first stop proper, and continuing his botanical research there. Unfortunately, the Viceroy of Brazil thought that the endeavour couldn't possibly be on just a scientific mission. He was very suspicious about why the visitors wanted to enter the country. At first, the crew of the endeavour wasn't allowed off board at all and Joseph Banks expressed his frustration about this in no uncertain terms in a letter to James Douglas. Three weeks I have been laying at anchor in this river, the banks of which are crowded with plants, animals such as I have never seen. All this time I have not been permitted to set my foot upon the land, because forsooth the gentry here think it impossible that the King of England could be such a fool as to fit out a ship merely to observe the transit of Venus. Oh, Perrin, you have heard of Tantalus in hell. You have heard of the Frenchman laying swaddled in linen between two of his mistresses, both naked and using every possible means to excite desire. But you have never heard of a tantalised wretch who has borne his situation with less patience than I have done mine. I have cursed, swore, raved, stamped and wrote memorials to no purpose in the world. They only laugh at me. Eventually the Viceroy would allow short forays into the country, but he changed the boundaries every day. Nevertheless, Banks and his team managed to collect specimens of some 300 species in the region. Joseph Banks was not alone in exploring the plants of foreign countries. He had with him two key figures. One of them was Daniel Solander, who had been a student of Carl Linnaeus's. Solander assisted Banks with the gathering of the plants and then studied, described and organised them. He really did much of the sorting work that was necessary to just get a grip on the vast amount of plants that they were bringing on board. After they returned to London, Solander resumed his duties at the British Museum, but he also became Joseph Banks's librarian for more than a decade. So from the very beginning, through to the return to London and beyond, Solander was a key figure in the preparation of the Florilegium. He also had with him Sidney Parkinson, who was the artist who drew the plants that were identified as ideal scientific specimens. He made sure that the memory of the plants and their characteristics was kept fresh. 
Sadly, Sidney Parkinson did not survive the journey, but he had a very keen eye. He recorded everything meticulously and provided such detailed sketches of the plants that he drew that later artists were able to pick up from his work. So without Parkinson, the production of the Florilegium would not have been possible. Banks, Solander and Parkinson were faced with a flora that they had never seen before. They might have seen some of the plants in dried form in other naturalists' herbaria, but now they saw them fresh in their natural habitat. Sidney Parkinson soon figured out that it made sense to talk to the local peoples. They used aid, war, were surrounded by the plants on a daily basis, and they knew much more about them than he did. For example, in Tahiti, where the Ipomea illustris was found, Sidney Parkinson recorded two uses of the plant. Boys drag for fish with a sort of net made of convolvulus leaves, and sometimes catch them with hooks made of mother-of-pearl oysters, large pinna maria, and other shells, and the shapes of them are very singular. And then he also found that the leaves were used in a peculiar method of staining garments. A girl that was present showed me the whole process, which is as follows. She took the young leaves of a convolvulus, unfoliated, and then broke off the tops of a small fig of a reddish hue, and squeezed out of it a milky fluid, which she spread on a leaf, rubbing it gently to mix the juice of the leaf, and then it became red. This she soaked up with a leaf of a solanum, and then daubed it upon some cloth. Parkinson actually made an effort to learn some of the words of the local language in order to communicate with the local peoples. On another occasion he met one of the chiefs and showed him some of my drawings, which he greatly admired and pronounced their names as soon as he saw them. And all of this added vastly to the botanical knowledge that Banks and his associates were able to carry back to England. It was of course impossible for the crew of the Endeavour to bring live plants back to England. They had collected some 3,000 specimens, many more individual plants, and they would simply never have survived the journey. So once they had gathered the freshly cut plants, they adopted two strategies. Firstly, they drew and described the freshly cut plants. And secondly, they dried perfect specimens for use in the herbaria, which would become object catalogues of the plants they had collected during the journey. Keeping fresh plants, to even just for a short period of time to draw them, is really difficult, and it was even more difficult on board the Endeavour in the different climates. So Banks and Solander found a really good solution for this. They put the living specimens into chests, Banks describes them as tin chests, and covered them with damp cloth to keep them fresh. By the way, to this day, the book-shaped boxes used by archivists for fragile materials are called Solander boxes. This method was really effective, so in a journal entry for the 12th of May 1770, while he was in Australia, Banks explains that the plants gathered at the ship's previous stop had been kept fresh in this manner, and they had lasted for 14 days. He says, during these two weeks, one draftsman has made 94 sketch drawings, so quick a hand as he acquired by use. The specimens that would be useful as scientific examples would then also be dried. But this also presented some practical problems. So Banks and Solander decided to dry the plants between quires of paper that they had brought with them. This was in effect printer's waste, proofs or imperfect printings of text that were not used otherwise. Their waste paper of choice, if you will, was nothing other than copies of John Milton's Paradise Lost. So between the pages of Paradise Lost, an entire world's worth of plants was brought back to England. 
Sometimes the use of fresh and herbarium specimens overlapped. Quite often during the voyage, the amount of plants gathered was simply overwhelming, especially once Parkinson also took on the responsibilities of the landscape artist Alexander Buchan, who had died while they were at Tahiti. This was also the case in New Zealand, where the unfortunate and sad encounters with the indigenous peoples overshadowed everything else. And at Endeavour River, the sheer amount of plants gathered there exceeded even those that had been found at Botany Bay. In New Zealand, Banks and Solander gathered circa 400 plant species in a very short amount of time, much more than Parkinson could portray in detail before they perished. Parkinson therefore developed the method of first just drawing a rough sketch which would show all the characteristics of the plant very clearly, and he knew that the herbarium specimens that would travel back to England could then be used to finish his drawings. So what is it like to draw on board of a large vessel? While well, the later journey of the endeavour was really fraught with accidents, repairs and all sorts of calamities, the beginning of the journey was quite calm, and Joseph Banks described this in a letter to William Philip Perrin in December 1768. Everything has been favourable. The winds and seas have combined to make our passages pleasant. Eighteen days brought us to Madeira, where though we only stayed five, we collected above 300 species of plants, 200 of insects, and this late in their autumn, the worst time of year for vegetation. But sometimes the weather could change quite suddenly, and that not only disturbed the minds and the stomachs of the crew, but also Sidney Parkinson, who was drawing on deck. On the 24th of October 1768, Banks recorded in his journal, about noon today we experienced what the seamen call a white squall, that is a gust of wind which came upon us quite unawares. Unattended with a cloud as squalls in general are, and therefore took us quite unprepared. It was, however, very slight, so no ill consequence ensued, except Mr. Parkinson and his pots going leeward, which diverted us more than it hurt him. But apart from these diversions, the engagement with nature also kept up morale during the journey, and this was particularly important at Batavia, which is now Jakarta, in Java. The Endeavour had a stop for repairs there on the return journey, and unfortunately many of the crew suffered from malarial fever and wouldn't survive the journey. But even prior to that they had been in low spirits. So Banks wrote in autumn 1770 that the greatest part of the crew are now pretty far gone with the longing for home, which the physicians have gone so far as to esteem a disease under the name of nostalgia. Indeed, I can find hardly anybody in the ship clear of its effects, but the captain, Dr. Solander and myself. Indeed, we three have pretty constant employment for our minds, which I believe to be the best, if not the only remedy for it. The voyage on the Endeavour was really just the beginning. Banks returned to London with some 3,000 specimens, of which 1,300 were previously unknown to botanical science, and he took all of them to his house in New Burlington Street, where Daniel Solander joined him as his librarian. The house actually proved to be too small after a while, so Banks moved to Soho Square, and he was a compulsive collector. He had large amounts of books and also large amounts of objects. And with these, he established himself and his house as a center for learned society, especially for naturalists of all kinds. Banks's post endeavor career is well known. He was made a baronet in 1781 and invested as a Knight of the Order of the Bath for his patronage of natural science in 1795. Banks was a trustee of the British Museum. He was King George III's advisor for the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, and he was appointed to president of the Royal Society in 1778, following in the footsteps of Christopher Wren, Samuel Pepys, Isaac Newton, and Hans Sloane, among others. 
His fame even spread beyond scientific circles. But the engraved copper printing plates that Banks had prepared for his Florilegium at Soho Square arguably made as lasting an impression. Join me in the next video to see how Sidney Parkinson's drawings were transformed into the beautiful engravings we have today. If you would like to learn more about these engravings, please visit our online exhibition at www.typeinform.com. There you will find our exhibition, but also articles and a podcast on Joseph Banks and his botanical investigations. We are Type and Form Antiquarian Booksellers, established in 2018, founded upon 50 years of experience.